Hi, and welcome to another amazing episode of Talking Sense. This season is all about sales, so I am finding every single sales expert that I can to come onto the show, and I'm really excited to have Pablo Dominguez, who is an operating partner at Insight, and he runs the Center of Excellence for Sales and Customer Success. Pablo also wrote a book, which I had no idea about. And so I'm pretty excited to talk a little bit more about his book that is launching in March, I believe, What a Unicorn Knows, How Leading Entrepreneurs Use Lean Principles to Drive Sustainable Growth. So Pablo, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Latvia. Good to see you again. Yeah, always good to connect. I love Insight. Yep. You guys are just (laughs) chocked full of all kinds of gold nuggets. Very helpful, very helpful for us, Port Coast. Yep. So tell me about this book. Like, where did this come from? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we've got a book coming out late February. Uh, Title, as you said, is What a Unicorn Knows. Um, And what we've done, uh, co-written with a a co-author of mine, Matt May, who's also written a couple of other books. Um, One of the things that we do here at Insight is leverage lean principles. So for those of you that are, are you know, maybe aware of lean or not, um, you might be thinking of lean as manufacturing, but we've sort of taken what Toyota's built uh, for lean, which is really about the elimination of waste, right? Process improvement and applied it to the SaaS world, to B2B SaaS and looked at it from a quote to cash process, everything from leads and marketing to the sales process to post sales. How do you do that more efficiently to decrease time to value? and get revenue in the door more quickly. So very applicable, honestly, for anybody that's looking to scale their business uh, of any size and just be more efficient. Now, what do you commonly see? So we went through it, I remember. Um, And whenever I hear lean, I think about, which I don't even know if they're related, but I think about like the five whys or like how you have to like keep digging. (laughs) Yeah. To get to, to like, the root cause. Yeah, the root yeah. cause. So maybe walk us through that. Like, how do people react? How do you really like dig in and find what's going on? Yeah. So it's it's actually fascinating. Like when we do lean process work, like we did with you all, um, and we've done it with around forty of our portfolio companies. It's really about bringing people together, right, across different functional teams. Whether you're in marketing, you know, a sales rep, an account manager, customer success. You're in legal because you're doing contracts. You want, basically want to get everybody together um, that is involved in the quote and cash process and have them collectively map out the process, like what's working, what's not. What you find is people are in their silo and they do their role based on what they were trained on, right? And they don't understand. So I just who throw this crap over the wall. <laughs> <laughs> who exactly, right? <laughs> and, I, and I do what I was told to do and then I give it to somebody else, right? Yeah. And so when they start to map it out, people's eyes open up and they start questioning like, well, wait, I don't think I needed that. Like I need, what I need is X, Y, Z. So you start with, you start with that group, like mapping it out. And then you ask them, all right, blank slate. How would you map out the process, right? What should the process look like? And on average, um, what we've seen through the engagements is we're able to reduce time to value by 25%, literally across any engagement. Gainsight, uh, we worked with Nick Meta. Um, they reduced time to value by 66%. Um, when we did the engagement with them just because they were trying to uh, get onboarding down significantly. So honestly, it's amazing to see what people can come up with when you bring them from different functional teams together. Now, is it hard to, I'm I'm trying, I think that there's a value add in a third party doing it. Have you found that people can do it themselves well, Um, or do they sort of need the... Yeah, it's a good question. I think it helps when... It definitely helps when a third party comes in to guide, right? Because then it feels like someone else is helping us see differently versus when it's internal, we found at least that there's a lot more politics involved because people think like, oh, well, Latney's running this. She has a vested interest at her company because of whatever function she's right. in, right? And so she's it's, so it's not going to be the world unbiased. and own all this stuff. So yeah, yeah. versus right. Or or, you know, head of sales runs it or head of product, then it's like somebody else's. So if a third party helps guide you through it, I think it, it sort of brings the barriers down, if you will. But 
a lot of times after we do it, we try to train the trainer um, and build a culture of lean within the company so that they are constantly looking at how to experiment, doing continuous improvement themselves. Um, but a lot of times we come back because they want to do a different workshop, et cetera. But I think the reason we wrote the book, the other question is like, so we can share those principles with people. And the book actually has very actionable frameworks that anybody can leverage, whether you're doing strategy, whether you're doing lean process, whether you're doing value mapping, et cetera. So um, I think people will find that exciting that it's actually very, it's not an academic book, if you will. It's very applicable and anybody can read it and actually take action from it. Now, are there common ones that you're like, we don't even have to do the workshop. I know these three things are probably screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, like like usually, especially as a company scales, right? Yeah. You, you, you buy systems, you start to put in more process. Um, you know, product always talks about taking on technical debt. There's go to market debt that you build as you scale, right? And you start to wonder, why does it take a contract so long to sign? Or why does it take a lead so long to get qualified, right? Or it takes us so long to bill an invoice. And so you see, you see these things sometimes and you're like, I, I know exactly what the issue is, et cetera. But the beauty is in the people coming up with the solutions themselves, right? Because ultimately they, we, we ask them to take the proposal to their executive team and get buy-in. So it's not, it's not us saying, hey, we found something. It's your team found this. They want to test it, run an MVP and then go live. Um, but it does help knowing where we can guide them because we've seen this so many times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things I love, you know, kind of switching gears into into insight is I I love that you have the point of view of hundreds of operators. I just have mine, right? And I I do my best yeah. to talk to lots of people and triangulate and and no other CMOS in the biz, but I just have my numbers. And I love that you you all do a great job with some of your benchmarking and you've been really crushing LinkedIn, putting a bunch of this stuff out there. Like, what are you finding right now? What are some of the interesting like trends yeah. or just data points that we should be aware of? Yeah, thanks. And, and for those of you that may or may not know Insight, right? So we're software investors in uh, the B2B SaaS place. Uh, we invest in growth companies. And we do have hundreds of companies that we support, right? Um, every vertical, every size, whether it's early, mid or late, um, every region. And so, Latney, to your point, we get to see a lot, right, in terms of what good looks like, et cetera. Um, we just released to the public um, our scale up by the numbers report, which you can find on the Insight website, which is open to anybody. There's no paywall or anything. No form. Um, really to give you what's no that? No form. No, no form. Yeah, no forms. <laughs> exactly. Per your, per your book. Um, anybody can, can download it. And so the purpose of that was to really share with the community, what's the investor's viewpoint in terms of what's important at a certain stage, right? So if I'm going from, you know, zero to 10 million, what do the investors look like? And then, Latney, to your point, what do the operators look like, look at, right? Um, and so we tried to call out some of the most critical um, metrics. And you could argue like, hey, you forgot this or that, but we've got hundreds of metrics to look at. We just pulled out the ones that were important. And so to your point, um, if you look at later stage companies, uh, you know, S&M efficiency, right? In terms of the, the percent you're spending on sales and marketing uh, as a percent of revenue, uh, one of the things we look at, and that's really important in today's day and age, right? Yes. Because of the economic sort of headwinds that are happening is like, are you efficient? Are you spending money like you should? The earlier you are as a company, right, in early stages, you're spending a lot on sales and marketing. Anywhere, I think the median is around 90%, right, of, of revenue because you're basically just trying to capture the market. As you get larger, that number starts to drop. amount of revenue, like there's a certain, yeah. like, minimum viable go-to-market that you need. So percentage-wise. Exactly. You know, worse, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and as you get... As you get larger, you know, once you start to get to 100 million, that number starts to drop to, you know, 24, 25% at a median level because you've gotten more efficient, right? So as you're going into the new year and you're facing pressure or you're looking to be more efficient and drive a sustainable business, really looking at those metrics on, am I spending the right amount on sales and marketing, right? Sometimes it should be more given you're doing investments. If you're at a certain stage and you're above the median, 
Um, and remember, these benchmarks are their stakes in the ground. It's, it's not like you should be exactly at X percent wherever, right? I'm always worried when people see benchmarks, they're like, well, Inside or Sequoia or Bessemer said that the number is X, so I got to get to X, right? Um, that's not the intent. The, the reason why we give the median and then the 75th and 25th is just to see if you're way out of line, yeah. right? Then there's something you should look at, right? If you're above the 75th percentile or below the 25th, that's something you should look at. But um, definitely look at where you're spending S&M, um, what, what your CAC payback what, looks like. Oh, sorry, go ahead. What would indicate you should be spending maybe over the midpoint? And what would yeah, indicate so, that you should be yeah. below? Below, yeah. So if you're going into new markets, if you're launching new products, right, and you've got to hire, uh, you know, marketers to, you know, to get the product, you know, out there, you've got to hire sales reps or BDRs or, you know, you've got a very technical product, you've got to hire new sales engineers. Um, that would necessitate, okay, that's why I can justify why my sales and marketing expense went up at the time, right? And I know there's going to be a lag in revenue, but I'm investing for it. So that would make sense. Um, if it was low, perhaps you have a very mature business, right? And you've got, um, the majority of your business, again, once you get to a hundred million plus, you rely more on, uh, the, your current base of customers, right? And expansion is cheaper than new business. And therefore you can, you can afford to have a lower, uh, expense on sales and marketing. So I think you just have to look at your business also, because the benchmark again will guide you. But if you're, if you're investing heavily, it's okay to have it higher because you're going to catch up to it, but just make sure. Um, you're thinking about your investments strategically, especially in this time, in, in this, in this day and age, right? Are you prioritizing your investments and are you thinking about what marketing needs, what product needs, what sales needs and post sales needs, not just your specific function? Yeah, it's interesting. I always tell my team sales and marketing, we share a wallet. So there's no, you know, well, let's have sales pay for that or sales should pay. For, I'm like, it's all, we're all one household. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, we're going through budgeting as, as a lot of people are. And, you know, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting year. I, I don't know. I think the budgets will evolve as the market evolves. Um, is, no, I agree. Is and my I think, prediction. I think. Um, no, you are absolutely right. And I think the, the, the prior years were, Hey, you set one budget and, you know, you go through the year, et cetera. I think people will need to be ready to set a budget and reevaluate it monthly, quarterly to make sure that it's on track with your forecast and how you're seeing pipeline build, um, and progress. Are deals starting to slip or push out more because the economy is getting tighter, right? So I think people are just going to have to be very malleable to what's going on in the market. Um, and be ready to pivot, right? Which might be difficult at times, but I think the companies that do it effectively and plan ahead and jointly, to your point, right? Sales and marketing jointly planning versus doing it in silos, I think will be the ones that come out ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, we can't get emotional. It's going to change because people are like, we made all these plans. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the world we're living in. <laughs> exactly. End of the day, all we are is a percent of revenue. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh. Well, um, uh, along those lines, you know, I'm sure you're taking a lot of calls with people frustrated, um, frustrated, maybe fried, you know, looking for guidance. Like, how are you instilling confidence in your Port Coast operators and sales leaders? Like, what what are you what are you telling them? Yeah, so it's so a great question. Like one of the. The best advice I got um, years ago when I was an operator, um, my boss said, you know, make sure you have the right team now, right? As you go into a tumultuous time, because that's the team that's going to get you through the hard times, right? And that's the team that's going to help you be successful. And if you wait too long, you're going to be having to make trade-offs that are going to make your life harder. And so, um, you know, we've all read the news around there's, you know, there's changes in, uh, you know, layoffs across the tech industry and whether you are, you know, restructuring, shuffling people around, um, I think you've got to start thinking very strongly about, you know, do I have the right people? How do I ensure I keep my best people, right? Like keep them motivated, et cetera, because people still will want to buy, right? We're not seeing things dry up. We're just seeing things slow down a little bit. CFOs are getting more involved on deals, right? Procurement. Procurement's um, having a real moment. Are, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, 
Um, everybody loves talking to CFOs. Um, you know, and deals are, you know, potentially getting a little bit smaller. So I still want to buy, but instead of maybe buying 200K or 20K, depending on your deal size, I'm, you know, I'm paying 80%, 50% of that because I need something smaller. So um, the key is like, don't give up, right? Like people will still buy, um, keep your team excited, make sure it's the right team and make sure that they're prepared on how to sell in this now challenging environment, right? Like how you sell, how you market will have to adapt to um, different personas, like we talked about CFO and procurement getting much more involved. Um, so deals do not stall um, and there's no decision. We even talked today on our leadership call about like the time value of money and, you know, cause people are going to negotiate finer points like payment term. Those have a cost, like, like <laughs> yeah. just like it's happening to us from our, our vendors, like, you know, right. things that maybe weren't as important before when money was less expensive. Yeah. And I think we saw a little bit of that during COVID, right? Like when, when COVID first hit and the world shut down, um, the question was like, Hey, I've got this renewal coming up. Can I, you know, can you extend it three months? Cause I just don't know what's going on in the world. Like I'm not willing to, to, to renew. Mm. And so I think you will see maybe not as creative, changes during COVID because COVID literally shut everything down. But I think people will, like to your point, uh, payment terms or, you know, renewal dates and extensions, uh, pilots potentially, we're seeing that come up a little bit as like, hey, can I do a pilot versus paying and then I'll pay after? And so the question is like, do you, you know, pay a little bit for the pilot and then it, you know, debits against your 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 contract when you sign it. So I think you've got to be prepared um as a leader to get your team ready for that and know how to answer it or proactively position it, right? If I'm hesitating as a buyer, um, what better way to say, hey, well, I've got a couple of options for you versus waiting for you to ask me for concessions, right? I should come prepared with like, here's, here's what I have in my toolkit to close this deal and be prepared to use it strategically. Not, here's what I would say is do not have a checklist and go, all right, if they said no to number one. Well, guess what? I got three other things to offer you. Let me like, you don't want to come across as that kind of salesperson, right? You want to be strategic about it, both with marketing, helping you with messaging and then the salesperson delivering it. So this is a good segue into, I think, being strategic as a salesperson today and just what it takes to, to sell today. And, um, you know, we've been doing this, this a long time. And I think the landscape has really changed. When you think about like 10 years ago, five years ago. And then today, a lot of things have stayed the same, you know, people buy from people, but there's also been a tremendous amount of, of change. And so how do you like, what, what do you think some of the biggest changes are that people need to really embrace today? Yeah. And I, I know there's been a lot of research done and this isn't new, right? In terms of by the time you get to the buyer, the buyers made 70% of the decision, right? They, because of the, the, the information age that we've lived in and the access to, to demos online and reviews. And I can talk to, you know, com I can join communities where people share information about uh, different solutions. I kind of already know what I want to buy, right? Or, or what my options are versus in the past, I'd have to educate the person on all these things, right? And so it's even more critical that well, why buy from, you know, Pablo versus Latney, right? If it's a similar product, right? It's like, well, who's able to demonstrate the value that you're truly bringing to me um, and the impact you're having on my company and who, who's, who's done the research to understand my pain point, uh, you know, uh, and who's actually um, done a really good job at connecting the dots between different people in the organization, right? I think the, the reps that single thread and think like, oh, I'm talking to Latney. She's got the budget. She's the buyer. Like this is this deal is going to go great, right? And then the deal doesn't go through, and it's you know back to our original point. Well, yes, it's her budget, and she's the buyer, and she's the decision maker. But guess what? The CFO is now involved in reviewing everything. Like, well, I should have known that, right? And I should have anticipated. And so, am I touching the different personas, right? Do I understand who's blocking? And like, I don't, I don't know. You say things are, haven't changed. To me, these are sales 101 fundamentals, but I don't no, know if every rep does this. Here's what I want to... So this is one of my like... I'm going to get out my little soapbox right now. So this is one of my many issues with the marketing qualified lead because a lead is by definition, one contact, one person. Right. 
And actually, the longer a deal goes on, the harder it is to multi-thread. Because people kind of almost think they own you or try to box you in. And so, you know, back to lean principles and stuff, like I I think that marketing has to really own multi-threading a lot earlier in the process. And like for us, our SLA is we don't pass something that doesn't have at least three meetings associated to it. Right. Three, so that's great. And it, even if yeah. it's an inbound hand raiser, we still need to get two more meetings, guys. Um, and we've just seen a totally different win rate from based on the number of contacts engaged in a deal. And so, you know, just kind of one of those things that like an alignment point, like it's not just on sales to multi-thread if 70% is done before they even have a conversation, like that's a good right. point to, to work through together anyway. So yeah, no, but, and, no, that's, <laughs> that, that's a, that is a great point. And I know we have some data that actually shows um, in the sales process, when you are having active engagement with the buyer, right? Or the decision maker versus, okay, once a month, so let's say it's a four month sales process and you're only connecting with them once a month. The reps that are connecting weekly, bi-weekly, whether, whether they're sending up follow-up collateral, doing additional demos, et cetera, the win rate goes up significantly, right? Um, because people want the engagement. And like you said, time kills all deals, right? And so the, the more you let it linger, the more you're allowing the buyer to second guess themselves or get more people involved in the process and slow it down, right? And so um, you've got to be definitely, you need to be fast strategically um, and make sure you're also, to your point, um, touching enough of the personas along the way. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is interesting is I think a lot of times in sales, the only thing you had was the demo. So you would like hold it back. Um, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, no, yeah. I'm going to do more. To, like, I, I, you know what I mean? And, and now like you have got to be a lot more, I think, product forward. And in, in marketing too, like we have this debate where it's like, if we put demos on the website, are people not going to request demos, <laughs> you know? And we actually got a 20% better conversion rate putting a short demo, a demo on yeah. first, you know, I mean, we had to, te we tested it. Cause I was like, I was scared of like, are we not going to get demos? But it's interesting. I think people expect to touch and feel and see something now. I agree. I agree. The, the, I think there's an ongoing debate on when you should demo, right? Should, well, to your point, like, do you put it on the website super early or as a rep, how early do you demo? And I think people, because I've already done the research, you're not catching me at the, like the beginning of my buying process when I talk to you is not like, I don't know what's going on. And so I think the more information you can share and provide people, you you need to make the solution real to people, right? And again, to, to the point that you always make around no forms, nothing annoys me more than, I just want to see the product, but I got to fill out all these things. And it's like, all right, like, why can't I just see something quick and then talk to someone? And then like, I'll give you more information. Um, that to me is just a big deterrent, yeah. right? Like it doesn't have to be so. the full thing, right? I, I talk about snacks. I'm like, we have to have a little snack. Everyone loves a snack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You wanna you wanna wet my appetite and go? Oh, you know what? All right, I want I want some more of this. Let me talk to someone. Um, now I'm interested yeah. because now I'm hungry, now right? And if I'm not hungry, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's talk about. We talked a little bit about this with the book, but. Um, I'm a big believer in finding the red. You know, I think that as a, as a leader, that makes me actually feel confident when I know the areas of my head that are screwed up and everything's always going to be, there's always, nothing's going to be perfect all the time. And so as you're like working with leaders, like where do you commonly see red? What are the biggest issues that like, if, if, you know, for the CROs, that are listening right now, like what are things that you're like, that you gotta watch this? Yeah, um, a couple of areas. One, people hired too much, right? And too quickly, uh, the growth at all costs mentality and you know, 2021, you could, argue, you could argue that that was, you know, has always happened. Um, so are you staffed appropriately, right? For, you know, you're gonna, you have your revenue target. Um, do you have too few people or too many people, right? And so, Again, making those trade-offs on where am I going to grow 
and where am I going to allocate resources? I think I think that's the, the, the toughest thing right now for sales leaders is I get my number and I've got to figure out, do I have the right people in the right places, whether it's regions, uh, verticals, uh, segments, right? Mid-market enterprise, SMB, Up to you get to a number. New. Yeah, net new versus expansion, right? There's a lot of discussion around like, hey, should I shift some resources that are hunters new to more expansion because new might dry up uh, if the economy continues uh, how it is, right? Um, and so I think that's the toughest decision is like the resource allocation and prioritization of where to put people. Um, but I think also the other element that goes not talked about as much, but I think is critical is there needs to be stronger alignment between product marketing and sales, um, especially now, right? So one of the things we talk about in the book is, um, you know, their lean principles. So not everything is a process is strategy, right? Are you employing the right strategy as a business to go into 2023, 2024? And by strategy, we mean like, where should you play and where should you not play? Right. And a lot of companies, well, we're going to grow into Europe and in Europe, we're going to do four countries and we're rolling out three new products. And it's like, okay, that might have sounded great last year. It's time to rethink that and say, do we have the resources and time and energy to be everywhere, right? Or to launch three products. And maybe should we focus on the core and only launch one product? Or um, do we abandon and stop doing certain things because the the juice isn't worth the squeeze there, right? I think those are the tough trade-offs that uh, the CRO, but with the CMO and the CEO and the product team have to make um, to be successful. And that, that's, where, that's where I think companies will feel pain if they do not make the hard trade-offs on where to focus. Yeah, you can't, I... I've been telling my team this a lot. We have to change the way we work. Fundamentally. Like yeah. just cutting a little here, a little there. Like we're all just going to be fried and annoyed. <laughs> like everyone's yeah. already working hard. So that doesn't, you know, we have to like either have a new mouse trap that's more efficient or to your point, lop things off so that we can do the right things well. And, you know, one of my biggest learnings from, Aperio was we were trying to be a product and a service company. And our CEO one day just said, you know what? There's not a lot of two sport professional athletes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> like, yeah. In fact, at least in, at least from my knowledge, there's only been one professional two sport athlete at Bo Jackson who was ever successful, like who was actually good at both, right? That's it. What? So he's like, I we gotta choose here. <laughs> yeah. like if we want to be professional athletes. You know, we can't be both. And so I think about that yeah. a lot. Like, will we be great? Like will we be at that level for whatever this thing is? And to your point, every new market and new product is inherently inefficient. It goes back to that 90, you know, if you're a young company, it's 90% co like that's yeah. the new region. That's the new product. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And so, and so not that you shouldn't, right? So if you're listening and you're like, well, are they saying I shouldn't go do those things? No, I think you just need to very carefully, especially now, be more thoughtful on where should I be and where should I not be, right? And if you can't justify going into that new market and it, in two years, it's going to actually generate X then don't do it. Focus on your core, right? Because it also depends on on your business, right? If you're burning a lot of cash and you've got to survive the next 12 months and that's all you're trying to do, then why would you spread yourself too thin, right? Be very laser focused. But hey, if you've got three years of runway or, or you know, you're a public company or something, you've got plenty of cash, well, then sure, you can take some additional bets and risks, right? But um, you just need to be very strategic going forward. So... I'm sure you see a lot of sales and marketing awesome alignment and misalignment. Oh yeah. <laughs> so do we go? I see a lot. Do we do top five, five misses or or top you know uh, positives? Which which way do you want to take this? Uh, let's start with the misses because those are easier. Okay. Right? Like, okay. It's, always, it's always hard to talk about the good things, but like, uh, and people like. People like the negative, people, humans as a whole like negativity more, a little bit more. So we'll start with that and then we'll end, with, we'll end on that. We'll lament and then we'll go pop. Yeah. The, the negatives we see um, are just the silos, right? Every, it's like every, every person for themselves. Sales goes and does their thing. Marketing goes and does their thing. And it's finger pointing, mm -hmm. right? Leads suck or 
uh, you're selling, you're, you're positioning things incorrectly and you're selling stuff that we don't even have. Like, what, why would you even say that? We don't even offer that. Right. <laughs> um, so I think the, the individual team mentality versus a unified team mentality is the biggest failure point. Right. And the lack of respect, um, and trust between the teams. Like I'm a big, Patrick Lencioni fan, right? Uh, the five dysfunctions of a team, right? Like the, the, the worst thing on dysfunctional teams, like there's no trust. And that's, that's what we see in the organizations, right? Like there isn't a trust, uh, or a lack or the, and there's a lack of respect between, I know you're going to provide value to me and vice versa. And so I think that's where strong leadership comes into play, right? If you have a very strong CMO like yourself, who's also done sales, um, and a strong sales leader that also understands and respects marketing, then that culture um, you know, it gets embedded in the organization and people realize, Hey, it's a symbiotic relationship. We need each other. And sure. There's always, by the way, there's always going to be friendly friction or like competition because that's how organizations are and people are. But when it's toxic is when it's bad. Right. Um, but it all starts with leadership. Like you cannot blame the teams for behaving a certain way. You have to blame the leaders. And so either make sure you have the right leaders, or if you're out there listening and you're like, huh, do I operate that way in a partnership? Like maybe you do, maybe you don't. I think there's an opportunity to reevaluate. Can you and your team be more effective by reaching across the aisle and, you know, working as a team versus as individual function? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think a lot to me, a lot comes to the measurement too. And yes, you know, I, I, I I'm big on CMOs. The, the boom stats are pipeline, but then you also need to understand how much pipeline you've created and is that enough? And the way to do that is looking at win rates and ASPs and cycle times. So you also need to care about those because if those aren't good, you got to create more pipeline. And so it's like this, yeah. like, so I think the faster you understand and own all like that whole life cycle and own is the wrong actually way to say it, but yeah. collaborate that on that and understand that then you're out of the passing game because it's like, no, we've got to balance. We have to balance all of these things. And if the win rates are really low, things are going to get expensive because I've got to create you know, a lot more coverage. And, and, you know, so how do we work together on what is the right amount um, of, and what is our efficiency model and what can we assume? And, and so that's why I think that quarterly really digging in, uh, by go to market segment, like getting really granular and saying, what can we assume a win rate is here? Like, this is the past. Right. Like, do you think we can improve? Are we going to get worse? That means we need more pipeline. But like, I, those are like the conversations I think that just have to happen every quarter so that yeah. you're, you're. I love that you brought, I love that you brought that up. Like one thing I like to say is like teams that teams that are measured together, win together. Right. If you think about uh going back to the the worst examples for sales and marketing is when both teams have their own metrics and you know somebody says like yes we won the other team's like what are you talking about <laughs> and they're like oh because i'm only measuring i yeah. i'm just told to measure on yeah. this right and so think about it from like a football team perspective right there's only one measurement like you either win the game or you lose the game you don't sit there and go yes defensive defensive stats were great but we lost the game but my but the stats were great it's like who cares yeah right like and so for sales and marketing, what counts is revenue, right? Like, did we generate revenue profitably? Yes or no, right? And so if everybody has their own pieces, you've got misalignment. And so I think it's very, I honestly think it's very important. You do a very good job of this, of making sure marketing and sales are measured the same way, view the same metrics, report on the same metrics, because the W in the win column is all that counts. Yeah. Right. Like that's it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, all right. So couple more uh you know you can't get off the show without telling <laughs> no us your biggest f up you learn more from your mistakes my biggest f up um so i'm thinking because there's been so many uh, which is yeah. good yeah that's right? good you've learned a lot <laughs> yeah i think my biggest mistake and i'm actually i'm actually glad i did it before i came to insight partners um i had 
I'd, I'd worked in consulting. I'd worked in two large public companies. And then I, I had an opportunity to go to a startup in New York. And I came in, and the analogy I've always used is I came in with, hey, I know exactly what to do. I, like, I've been in the promised land. I know how to build a Ferrari because I've done it, right? And I had all these grand aspirations to, to fix things and roll things out. And it's like the body rejected the organ and people were like, what's going on? And I was like, what do you mean what's going on? Like Ferrari. And my boss is like, they don't even know what a car is. What do you mean you're going to roll out a Ferrari? By Ferrari, I mean like, you know, complicated, sophisticated programs. Um, And it made me realize, you know, for the stage that they were in, there was a garage with car parts, like not even an instruction manual on how to build something. And I realized, we don't even need a car. Like, I don't even know if, we, if they need a bicycle. Like, they need, need a scooter. scooter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> it's like a skate. Like, let me start with that. And so um, I wasted six months and probably put the organization through a lot of strain. Um, and by waste, I mean, like, we could have gotten so much more done if I had just focused. And so at month six and day one, it was like, all right, I'm just going to do X, right? I'm going to put the wheels on the skateboard and just do that. And so that's actually helped because now that we work, my team and I with insight companies, right? The biggest failure point I see when we hire executives, whether it's a marketing leader or a sales leader, are the same people that try to come in and overbuild, over-engineer and can't make the switch, right? I'm glad I was able to, but I've realized not everybody can. And that takes a toll on the organization, right? If somebody's in the, in the role for 18 months trying to do things that the, the org is not ready for. So Huge screw up for me. I'm glad it only took six months uh, and that I was able to come out of it. But um, uh, it's it's make, it's definitely made me stronger today. We have a saying: Rome wasn't built in a day, but every day they were laying bricks. Yeah, exactly. You know? and I'm just kind of like, you know, we've got some issues, progress. but it's okay. Let's yep. lay some brick. <laughs> we just got to get this, these bricks. As long as you're moving forward, it's good. And we'll get these done. Um, but yeah, yeah, and I can see that. I mean, I remember when I started at Sixth Sense, I was, there was one other marketer and me. And it's like, I don't, there's so much to do. Um, yeah. But at the same time, what's fun about being at that stage is you really can't mess anything up. Like anything you're doing True. is better. <laughs> there was, wasn't a lot it, there to begin. That is a good, <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah, it's like at that stage, any progress is some progress, yeah, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> But it's it's knowing how much progress to provide versus overdoing it. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, last question. So we have a big campaign right now. Proceed with confidence. How do you like? What makes you confident despite everything? Um, I think my team. I think we have a very awesome team that we've hired, and they are you know they love the work they do, and they love engaging with the companies that we've invested and worked with, and. Um, while things are challenging, like, you know, companies are still growing and innovating and bringing new products to market that are changing the world. And that's exciting, right? Like, I love what I do. I love the company I work at. I love the team. And so, you know, engaging with people like you that are part of the Insight portfolio and seeing the successes of the people we work with, that even though there will be some challenging times, like, that is exciting just knowing that we can help um people or be of assistance and uh that keeps me going from a from a work perspective obviously and then you know personally i've got a great family um but uh yeah it's it's exciting like during challenging times is when new products come out new solutions come out people become more innovative and so while it is a challenging time i think it will bring innovation to the world um and that's exciting yeah i do too i do too well, I got to yeah. say thank you for all well, thank you. your team has done, Gary's team has done, the broader Insight team has done. Uh, appreciate it. And appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing well, thanks for having me. so many listeners, you know, all the things that, that we get to, to access. Um, so many great nuggets. And I just, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. I can't wait to get your book. I can't wait to go on a book tour together. Um, Thanks so much. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, and congrats on uh, your second edition of the book. That is awesome. So it'll be a great new year for us. <laughs> totally, totally. Thanks, Pablo.